Ξεκινάμε. So we're ready to start. It is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Dr. Spiridon Aliferis. He's coming from Callum Center for Fusion Energy, Oxford, UK. Let me uh, say a few words since the first time he speaks in our seminars. Uh, uh, he got his uh, diploma uh, from the University of Patras in Electrical Engineering. And uh, he continued at the same uh, university jointly with the University of Grenoble in Fran France for his PhD also in uh, plasma physics. Uh, after that, he started a series of uh, uh, postdoc positions as usual. And this uh, include the uh, Hellen Hellenic Army Research Center the Foundation of Research and Technology in Crete, Democritos uh, here in Athens, the National Center for Scientific Research Democritos. And then since uh, 2017, he's at Calham at Oxford, where uh, since to, uh, 2021, he works as plasma control engineer. He has participated in uh, several experimental campaigns as the Synchrotron Soleil in France, the University of Jyväskylä, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, in Finland, uh, the Joint European uh, Taurus uh, campaign, and the IRFM uh, Saint Paul Les uh, Durand also in France. Uh, as you understand from the introduction and the title of the talk, he uh, works uh, in uh, plasma physics, mainly as an uh, experimental physicist. You already know the title that appears on the screen, The Taming of the Stars, How to Control Fusion in Plasmas. It's, we are very glad to have, us, to have you with us, and you may start. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Patsis. Um, so uh, today I will talk to you about fusion plasmas and uh, more specifically how we, we can uh, control them. Uh, my, uh, the, the picture I've chosen for this first slide is uh, quite important for this talk. This is not the facility I'm working in. This is ITER, a new project which is currently built in the south of France. Uh, and uh, it is a very big experimental uh, fusion reactor. If you, if you see the little orange dots, these are actually persons. Uh, so that, that should give you a, a sense of the scale. And uh, today, uh, if I'm successful, you will get a little bit better understanding of what is happening, just, not just in the core of, of the tokamak, and the plasma, the plasma physics involved, but also why do we have all these systems surrounding the tokamak? Uh, some of them are uh, safety systems, some of them are actuators, some of them are diagnostic systems. What, how do we use them uh, in order to, to control the plasmas? So uh, very briefly, uh, there is no need for, for another introduction. Mr. Patz has covered everything, but uh, very briefly, I will tell you how, about my experience in, in fusion. So after my PhD, I started working in Greece, uh, initially in the Foundation of Research in Crete and uh, later in Democritus, where I started participating in the, gen, in, in the JET campaigns. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, I was seconded to JET uh, while I was still working for the, uh, uh, for the National Center of Research Democritus. Uh, as an expert in, initially in uh, plasma diagnostics and later in plasma control. Uh, when the UK got out of, um, got out of uh, Europe uh, last year and uh, the secondment scheme was, uh, was stopped by, by, the, by Eurofusion, which is the consortium that controls the, the European grant uh, for uh, fusion, uh, I started working directly for the laboratory in Callum uh, as a plasma control engineer, uh, working on joint European Taurus. I continue working there, of course, uh, but also working in a new project uh, that is currently designed here in the UK. And it is uh, a, a new uh, fusion plant 
uh, to be implemented in, in, the next, <laughs> in the next year. Uh, we are currently in the conceptual design and this is uh, another part of my, of my work. But uh, to talk about fusion, let's go a bit at the beginning. Uh, let's talk uh, about what do we know about fusion? How do we know that it exists? Well, fusion is happening uh, inside the stars. <laughs> Most of you know that uh, better than me. Uh, and uh, if we look at what is happening inside the sun, every second, the sun fuses about uh, 620 uh, million metric tons of hydrogen and makes about 616 metric tons of helium. In the process, it releases energy that uh, a part of this energy we receive as, as uh, light. The fusion reactions don't stop there. They go, uh, the, the, they go higher, they fuse, the, the helium uh, particles fuse into higher particles as well. And actually up to iron uh, 56, uh, the fusion reactions are exothermic. There is an, an energy gain. However, there is a problem here. The problem is that the, the, initial, uh, the initial reaction for this proton chain uh, that leads to the formation of helium is uh, very difficult to happen. The probability is very low. If we look at the reaction rate for the proton-proton fusion, it's in, it's in the order of 10 to the minus 46 uh, meters cubed per, square, uh, per, per, per second. For the sun, this is not really a, pro a problem because the sun is very big. But if we look at the efficiency of the system, every cubic meter of, of the sun only produces something like tens, something in the order of tens of watt, which for a system working here on Earth is simply not sufficient enough. Uh, another observation about the sun is that uh, if we look at the surface of the sun, where we can we can do a lot of diagnostics from the Earth or from from satellites. Uh, what we see is that the Sun is uh, has a lot of instabilities. Uh, the, the fusion plasmas uh, contain a lot of energy, and because of that, they are very susceptible to to instabilities. For the Sun, this is really not a problem because it has this enormous gra this enormous gravity holding everything together. Uh, however, here on Earth, we don't have the luxury of instability. A system like this would be unreliable and most probably it would burn anything, anything that, that would come in contact with. So how do we do fusion here on Earth? Well, first of all, we have to look for a more efficient fuel because the proton-proton fusion is not efficient enough. Uh, this is established. We cannot change the perceptions. But if we look at the various uh, nuclei that we can fuse uh, and uh, we, we can find much better candidates. The best candidate is uh, the combination of deuterium and tritium. And if we look at the reactivity of these uh, two uh, of these two elements, we see that it is uh, about 10 to the 25 times higher compared to the proton-proton uh, fusion. However, even in this case, to achieve this high reactivity, we need temperatures in the order of hundreds of million Kelvin, or if we talk in EV, in the EV, uh, in EV terms, we, we need something like 10 kilo EV. But this is doable. We have the technology to do this here on Earth, and we will talk about, uh, about this. Now, another note on, this, on the choice of these two fuels is that they, they are both relatively abundant. Well, deuterium is really abundant. If we look at the deuterium that exists in the, in the bodies of water that we have on the surface of the Earth, we have something that exceeds 10 to the 13th power tons of deuterium uh, available for us. So it is really, really an inexhaustible source. Um, for the tritium, unfortunately, it, it, tritium is a beta emitter. It has a half-life of 12 years, and this is why we don't really find it uh, on Earth here in nature. Uh, so it must be bred. Uh, however, we, the, 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 the reaction that can breed uh, the tritium is uh, basically the reaction between neutrons, which are 
available from the fusion reactions, and lithium. Lithium is a relatively abundant material. Uh, now, of course, the hope is that uh, in the future, the, the, the fusion will, will, we will be able to do fusion even with between deuterium and deuterium that will simplify a lot the fuel cycle of a, of a fusion plant. Now, is it just a question of temperature as we talked about before? Not really. Uh, the, the, the answer to this question is, is more complicated, but a very simple way to, to look at the problem is to, to, to look at the Lawson criterion. Lawson uh, in 1955 uh, established the conditions that are needed in order to achieve a, a self-sustained fusion plasma. And uh, qualitatively, if we look at the conditions, basically he said that we need to have enough fuel, that means the density needs to be high enough, heated to high enough temperature, the temperature needs to be high enough, and for long enough, confined for long enough, that means that the energy confinement time needs to be high enough, and if all these conditions are met, then we can have a, a self-sustained plasma. Uh, if we look at the mathematic formulation of this, uh, it's uh, this minimum for the triple product that we see here, uh, which depends on the temperature and also depends on the, uh, on the, uh, on the cross section. If we look at the calculation that we made for the different isotopes and the temperature as a function of the temperature, uh, of the of the plasma, uh, what we see is that for the deuterium tritium fusion, we have a minimum which is somewhere around fourteen kilo electron volt, and uh, this minimum is calculated to be three to the three to the ten to the twenty one kilo eV uh, times second uh, over meters cubed. Uh, how do we achieve this? Well, there are many ways to achieve this. If we look, for example, at inertial confinement fusion, well, the sun achieves everything by the gravity. Uh, the gravity holds everything together. It, it has sufficient heat, even though the heat, the, the, the temperatures that we find in the sun are not as high as we need here on Earth. Uh, if we look at inertial confinement fusion, we have very high densities because a laser is, is uh, it, it, is incident on the on the fuel, uh, but uh, the the let's say the most popular way to do it here on Earth is the tokamak. So the tokamak uh, in the tokamak the idea starts in a very simple manner. Let's instead of having a, an elongated pl plasma, we create a torus so that there is no end to the plasma. The plasma that we have inside the torus is confined because it follows the magnetic field that is, that is generated by the, by the toroidal coils. However, there is a, a main problem in this very simple configuration. The coils are closer together on the inside of the torus than the, on the outside of the torus, and that creates a, a, a toroidal field, which, uh, which is in inverse function of the, um, of the radial uh, axis. Uh, the, this non-uniform field separates the charges and creates a, a, an electric field. This is happening because the charges, as they gyrate around the magnetic field, they meet different strengths of the magnetic field. And because of that, the, the Larmor radii around the magnetic field have different uh, chains as a function of the magnetic field. And this electric field is creating an E cross B drift that is directed radially out, outwards. So if we look at this plasma, we can really not establish an equilibrium. The solution to this is the final form of the tokamak. In the final form of the tokamak, what we do is we, indu we induce a current in, this, in the core of the plasma, and this current is creating a poloidal, uh, a poloidal magnetic field, which goes around the torus, 
the short way. And the combination of the toroidal field and the, and the poloidal field is this Helka field that we see here. If we look at the whole configuration, it looks like this. The magnetic field goes helically around the, uh, around the torus uh, uh, from the combination of the, of the, of the currents from, of the toroidal coils and the plasma current. Uh, in this configuration, the, uh, at, the beginning of the at, the, at the beginning of the plasma, when the plasma is still relatively cold, the central solenoid that induces the current in the plasma can also be used for, uh, for heating the plasma. Uh, and this is because th this is basically ohmic heating. The, the, there, is a, uh, there is a conductivity uh, in the, the, there is an impedance, a conductivity in the plasma, and the current that is induced is creating ohmic heating. And uh, this, is, uh, this, is heating the, this is heating the plasma. However, because the resistivity. Uh, Λοιπόν, εγώ βρήκα κάτι μαραμένα αντίδια στο Βασιλόπουλο και τα πήρα. Ε, γιατί ήταν εκεί πέρα και ήταν και... Κυρία Λισανδράκη. Κυρία Λισανδράκη, αν μπορείτε, κάντε μνιούτ γιατί σας ακούμε εμείς. Συγγνώμη, συγγνώμη. Τα ραδίκια και τα αντίδια. Τόσο. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the heating uh, changes as a function of the temperature because the temperature changes the impedance of the plasma. And uh, so in higher temperatures, the, the, this kind of heating is not efficient enough and we need to turn to other forms of heating. So if we look at the cross section of a real plasma inside the tokamak, we will see something like this. The magnetic field that we have created, uh, if we take the iso B contours uh, of the magnetic field, we will see that it creates these, uh, these uh, surfaces, magnetic flux surfaces with the same magnetic field that are closed. Uh, and the, the, the plasma is confined within this magnetic field, uh, within these this, uh, uh, surfaces. Now, if we take a plasma which is just, well, it is not exactly a cylinder, but it is close to a cylinder. There is a major disadvantage. And the disadvantage has to do with this plasma will be basically limited by the first point that comes in touch with the surrounding of the plasma, which is, which is the vessel. And uh, the problem with this uh, is double fold. So it's twofold. So the, the, the first part of the problem is that we are cooling the edge of the plasma and we don't really want that. And the other problem is that the particles from the plasma erode the vessel and these impurities can contaminate the plasma. They can dilute the fuel and they can radiate power. And at the end, they can even collapse the plasma. So we came up with a different solution. In this different solution, uh, we, create, we created a diverted plasma. Basically what we did is we took the configuration of the magnetic field and we used additional coils to modify the flux surfaces at the edge of the plasma to divert the plasma towards the so-called diverter, uh, which is basically an exhaust system uh, and can, with, can, can sustain higher fluxes of power. Here we see uh, an oversimplified configuration uh, uh, of uh, we see a very uh, an oversimplified configuration of uh, the of a diverter plasma where we use a, a single current in a coil uh, right here in order to create a, a point where the poloidal magnetic field is zero. And, uh, but in reality, the way we create these diverter plasmas is more complicated because we don't just want to create this X point which separates the plasma in what is inside the core and which is characterized by closed magnetic flux surfaces and the scrape of layer. 
which is the blue part and is characterized by open uh, magnetic flux surfaces. But we also want to control where exactly this happens and where exactly these points meet the, uh, the, the, the diverter. Yes. So using this configuration, we have managed to build uh, multiple machines. Uh, a lot of them, they are currently working in many places around the world. Uh, this is, uh, these are just the tokamaks that we currently have, not, not other kinds of machines like Stellarate or, or um, uh, other facilities. And uh, a very good example of a tokamak and the, the facility where I'm currently working at is the Joint European, European Torus. The Joint European Torus is currently the only facility where we can actually do deuterium tritium uh, fusion experiments. And uh, we have done a few of those, but not a lot, because they are very expensive and they are very difficult and uh, they are very hard to organize. So uh, there, there were some uh, older experiments in 91, but the first D real DT experiments in the diverter configuration uh, was in 1997. Uh, and uh, it took us <laughs> another, uh, uh, it took us another 24 years before we managed to do the another DT experiment uh, recently at the end of 2021. And if we look at the progress that we made during these years is, you see, the black lines are the fusion power that we managed to get. We got two pulses. One was very short, but very high fusion power, and the other was long enough, uh, actually uh, reaching the limits of the machine because the machine is not superconducting, it's made out of copper, so we cannot have a very long pulses. And uh, in uh, the recent campaign, uh, and this is from the press release we had uh, recently, we actually managed to have a higher fusion yield. The impressive part, the impressive part of this work is not just the fusion yields that we achieved, but it is also the fact that we achieve them in this new configuration. What you see here in this, in this picture of the diverter of the tokamak is the new configuration that we have. The main part of the wall is made of beryllium and the lower part, the diverter is made of tungsten. The older, uh, configuration we had in Z was made out of uh, carbon materials, uh, but this was unacceptable because tritium was dissolved, was absorbed by carbon, and uh, this this was this was completely unacceptable in terms of nuclear safety because you, you don't want tritium to be to be uh, absorbed by by the machine. Uh, another very important aspect of these results that we managed to have is that these results fit very well with the, within the models that we have developed in order to extrapolate for bigger experiments like ITER, which is, uh, which is currently built in the south of France. And uh, this, is, this is very important because it, allow, it, it verifies the models that we have built and uh, we can use it to better design the future experiments. Uh, there are plans for another DT, uh, DT campaign here in Jet, which hopefully will happen soon. And uh, in 2027, the first plasma of ITER is, uh, um, uh, is planned to happen, even though the first plasma will not be a DT plasma, that will take a bit more time. Now, let's go closer to the title of my presentation. And uh, the, the title is really, how do we control these things? How, how, can, we, uh, how can we tame these this, um, very as, uh, as unstable medium, which is the fusion plasma? And uh, if we look at the generic uh, structure of a control, um, of a control uh, circuit, of a control, uh, yeah, of a controller we use in plasmas, uh, we basically have a reference, which is what we want to achieve. 
we have a controller which controls an actuator. The actuator can be many different things, and we will talk about this. And then we have usually a feedback loop, which is a diagnostic system that makes some sort of measurement. Again, we can have many different diagnostics and it doesn't even have to be a physical diagnostic it can be a synthetic diagnostic or, or an observer that gives us value. Uh, and uh, we basically are trying to minimize the error between these two, uh, these two things. We are trying to get our, our measurement as close to the reference as possible. Uh, we need to make a distinction here. Well, the first part is we need controllers for fusion plants. And uh, this is happening mostly in feedback loop. We don't want people to operate <laughs> a fusion plant. The fusion plant needs to be able to operate itself. And also we have some other kinds of, of uh, control systems that are not really controlling anything, but they are just observers. They are just monitoring systems. There are no actuators involved other than some responses that might be, that might be the result of, of, a, of an alarm or something like this. In experimental tokamak, the situation is a bit more complicated. We, again, we have the feedback controllers. We are using them uh, or testing them, uh, depending on the physics experiments that we are trying to implement. But we also do a lot of feed forward uh, waveforms. We basically prescribe the waveforms to study the physics that we want to study. And uh, we don't always rely on, on feedback loops. Now, Let's take a closer look at each of these systems. We talked about the diagnostic systems. Uh, here we have the diagnostics of JET, even though this is a relatively old picture uh, and we have installed a few more. Uh, but as you can see, experimental reactors are heavily diagnosed. Uh, we use all these diagnostics to do physics studies. Again, a distinction need, a distinction need, to, be, need to be made. Uh, the distinction is between an experimental reactor and a fusion plant. In a fusion plant, you don't want that many diagnostics. You want your system to be as simple as possible, and uh, you only need the diagnostics that you use for control and for safety. Otherwise, the reliability and the lifetime of the machine will be, will be heavily impacted. Uh, then we have the typical plasma controllers that we, that we use. And here I take the example of JET, where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm currently working. And uh, if we look at the diagnostics that we have, we have magnetic diagnostics, plasma boundary determination, we have density diagnostics, temperature diagnostics, neutron rates, spectroscopy signals, bolometry, and multiple other signals. However, these are the, the ones that, that I mentioned because these are the ones we routinely use uh, in some obscure designs, we might use some, some more uh, sig diagnostic signals, but th these are the ones we really use all the time. And then as actuators, again, multiple actuators, but there are main uh, actuators that we use all the time. This is the magnetic field uh, systems, uh, this, all the coils around the, the tokamak that generate the magnetic fields, the fueling systems, which is basically systems that, that inject gas or in some cases they inject uh, cryogenic pellets. Uh, and we also have the heating systems. These are the systems that provide energy to the tokamak. And this is not just ohmic heating, we use different kinds of heating systems. And then the different controllers that we use here are just, just some examples. We have uh, the vertical stabilization controller, we have the shape controller, we have the plasma density feedback, and uh, we have many, many experimental specific experiment specific controllers that we use. Now let's go to, to an example uh, and see how fusion would not happen uh, without, uh, without controlling uh, the plasma. Uh, if we look at the first plasmas that they achieved back in 1983 when, the, when Z was firstly built, uh, we will see that because there was no control of, of the vertical position of the plasma, 
and the plasma is naturally elongated. What happens basically is that there are currents induced in uh, various parts of the machine, and these currents naturally elongate the plasma. As we see, the plasma is attracted by the purple, the, the plasma that we see here elongated is attracted by these purple um, uh, iron polar expansions. Uh, and uh, there are ways to control this. Uh, however, in the beginning of the, of the jet, the, this, this, these systems were not available. And we, we would see the plasma uh, having a vertical displacement, a very abrupt vertical displacement, or almost exponential growth of the, vert of the vertical displacement. And the plasma would just disrupt after that. Uh, there are systems that we have implemented in order to, to control the situation. Uh, the shaping of the circuit is controlled by these coils that you see here, the yellow coil, which is called PFX coil. And um, we can adjust the elongation, which is affecting, of course, the, the vertical instability. But we also have special coils, uh, like the ERFA. Well, here it is called VRFA, but it's the FRFA, but it's it's basically the same system. Uh, and this is the actuator that we are using in order to control the vertical stabilization. Um, if we look at the instabilities, and this is determined experimentally, so this is there is not further analysis that they have done here. If we look at the at the instabilities, the instabilities that displace the, the, the plasma vertically grow very quickly. Uh, typical values of the di displacement are 200 uh, per second. And for this growth rate, an instability that in 11 milliseconds has reached one centimeter, in 23 milliseconds has reached 10 centimeters, and then in 34 milliseconds has reached one meter. And we are talking about a machine <coughs> which is about eight meters high, but the actual, the actual uh, vessel is about four meters high. So we see very big displacements very quickly. How do we control this? Uh, well, what, what they, the, the, the people back in the day, what they actually did is they designed a control system that uses some of the coils that control the magnetic field as actuators and then they build an observer that is looking at the speed, at the vertical speed of the plasma. Why not the position? Because the position would require to, to solve a, a, a harder equilibrium problem, a MHD equilibrium problem, and that would take too much time. And this is happening really fast. So we, we need to be very responsive. The, 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 the vertical speed of the plasma, it's much easier to calculate, and this is what we do. And the system is basically controlling so that the vertical speed is zero. Uh, however, in some cases, even today, sometimes we lose vertical stability. And when this happens, we have vertical displacement events, which can be really uh, big disruptions can be very disrupting for the for the tokamak. Now, let's take a look at a different kind of system, um, uh, and this is again in the, within the systems that I I mentioned. This is a monitoring system. This is not a controlling. This is not a system that actually controls an actuator, but this is a system that provides alarms and tells us if we have reached a, a, a dangerous state. So here you see the internal part of the tokamak. And uh, this internal part, as, you, uh, as I told you before, is made of beryllium and tungsten and various different components. And for each of these components, we have different uh, heat loads that they can withstand. Of course, the direct way is to use cameras like IR cameras and monitor the heat load that goes into these components. However, cameras are, are, are very sensitive to neutron da damage uh, in a fusion environment. So it is, not, it is not a very good solution for a fusion plant. And this is why in Z there, uh, there was a, a model-based system that has been developed, which is called WALS. 
And with this system, we can go to the various components. You see here the tungsten diverter and the beryllium tiles, and we can calculate how much power will be deposited. How does this work? Well, this is fairly involved. If we look at the, at the internals of the system, we need to calculate the MHT equilibrium in real time. And we do, the, we do this using, a, a, um, using a, an algorithm which is called the X-log. And then we need to calculate the exhaust power. That, that is basically the power that leaves the core of the plasma and gets into this thin area, which we call scrape of layer and then use the equilibrium to map this exhaust power to the various components of the wall. And by doing this calculation, we have a, we have a way to, to, to measure the, the damage to the various components without needing direct measurements, which is extremely useful for, for a fusion plant. Now, uh, the, we, we need to develop a lot more systems in order to control a plasma. And one of the most interesting, well, one of the, some of the most interesting um, phenomena that are happening in the plasma, but also most distracting phenomena that are happening inside the plasma have to do with disruptions. What is a disruption. Basically, a disruption is when, due to some reasons, uh, we have a very rapid loss of the energy of the plasma. The current decays very quickly within tens of milliseconds. The power loss that we have because we quickly read, we, we, we quickly lose all the stored energy in the plasma can be hundreds of times higher than the actual heating power that we apply. And in these cases, we have eddy currents from the, that are induced to the vessel that can be very destructive. And in some, rare ca in some cases, we can even have relativistic electrons, uh, electron beams that are formed. We, we call them runaway electrons. And this can also be very destructive to the plasma. Now, disruptions, is a very complicated phenomenon, but initially in early jet days, these disruptions were associated with radiation from impurities. So uh, basically, in, people believed, the, the, the researchers initially believed that if the power is radiated from the core of the plasma due to impurities, there will be no power left to reach the plasma boundary. In this case, we see the plasma contracting and also the radiation zone that is close to the edge of the plasma is moving inwards. And this was actually verified by experiments. However, the, over the next 20 to 30 years, we have realized that disruptions are actually much more complicated and they have a variety of causes. But why I'm talking about disruption? Well, as we see for disruptions, the radiated power due to impurities is, is really important. And this is a good opportunity for me to show you a system that we that was recently developed for, for Z, and uh, I, I actually participated in this effort <coughs> that is using bolometer signals that look in different places inside the tokamak in order to, to, do the, to, to solve the inverse problem and to solve the inverse problem in real time using tomographic inversion method based on maximum likelihood uh, approach. Now, this, the plasmas that we studied using this method are plasma with extrinsic impurities, are basically plasmas where we injected impurities in order to have highly radiative discharges. And um, when this happens, the plasma can become very unstable, as we explained, uh, as people knew since the early days of, of plasma. Uh, this system, as we can see, we can identify zones which are of 
high interest for the stability of the plasma. And we can even use the calculations that we made based on this method <coughs> to, to see how probably disruption is. Uh, and this is again an example of a monitoring system that is not actually using, it is not actually controlling anything, but we can use it uh, to, to monitor the stability of the plasma. And then we can also provide some alarms for the system, even though in this case that was not that was not the case. <clears throat> now let's talk a bit more about instabilities. Uh, because instabilities are really interesting and uh, are probably the biggest problem we have with, uh, with plasmas. As it is in the sun, we have here on Earth as well, many instabilities. And I will not talk about all of them because they are too many, they are too complicated. I will concentrate in one of those instabilities that, that we meet all the time. And I also have a lot of experience dealing with. And this, has to, this instability is called edge localized mode. But before let's talk about the confinement of the plasma. What we see experimentally is that under certain conditions, typically when the, the input power to the plasma is higher than a certain threshold, which we don't calculate analytically, but we can we have scaling laws that is that, that are giving us the, the, the threshold. A transition occurs to a higher confinement mode, which we call H mode. The energy confinement in this mode increases typically by a factor of two. It's quite higher. And what we see is a, a transport barrier forming at the ends of the plasma, which experiments show that is due to the reduction of turbulence in this very thin area. Radial gradients of uh, the density and temperature in this transport barrier are enhanced greatly. And uh, as I told you before, even though it was discovered in the 80s, we still don't know how to reproduce this with a model, but we have empirical understanding of how, how it works. What we see in this case is that this edge transport barrier is creating a pedestal, basically it lifts the entire pressure and thus the energy content profile of the plasma higher. And uh, this plasma, we, we can achieve much higher confinement. And this, this is by this model. However, this, this um, uh, adds transport barrier, sorry, this edge transport barrier is, uh, can, can very easily collapse. And when it collapses, there is a sudden burst of particles that leaves the core of the plasma and goes to the wall. And this can cause very serious problems like erosion of the tokamak wall. And also when this erosion happens, it can later contaminate the plasma with the impurities that were actually eroded. But ELMS, again, as everything in plasmas, is a very complicated issue. It's not just, there is not just one flavor of ELMS, there are multiple. Uh, but the, the two types of ELMS that we meet uh, mostly in our experiments are type one ELMS, which are big, strong ELMS that happen with a lower frequency or type three elms. And these type three elms are smaller elms, less destructive, but they are happening with a very high frequency. And this is the main reason I'm, I'm mentioning these instabilities. It is because we really need to control them and we know what we need to do. We basically need to control the frequency to get these uh, higher frequency, smaller elms and to avoid distracting our our machines. Uh, how do we actually control them? Well, empirically, what we have found, and there is an explanation for this, uh, or, or even though it can be very involved, 
we have found that we can control the ELM frequency by injecting gas. So the, the gas that we inject can control, here controls the ELM period, so it also controls the, the, the ELM frequency. So basically what we did is we designed a control system that uses the gas injection module as an actuator, and then it uses the real-time bolometer signal to make a real-time uh, estimation of the L frequency um, to, to take the measurement and close the loop. What we see here is the application of this circuit, and we can see a few things. Well, the first thing is that uh, we can very efficiently control the L frequency uh, around the requested value, which is the red line that we see here. But we can also see that when we change the request, the system can adapt relatively well. At the same time, what we see is that when we change the strike point position, which basically when we change the location of the plasma inside the torus, the system can adapt quite well, having the same request, but needing different gas, uh, different amount of gas injection. So we have created a relatively robust system that we have been using um, throughout the last years of the experiments that we do here in Z, and we have been using quite a lot, even during the Ethereum tritium. Now, if we look at other ways to control these elms, uh, we, can, uh, we can also look at other things that are basically probing the, the, the surface of the plasma, the edge of the plasma. And one of these things is the hydrogenic pellet, the, the cryogenic pellets that we use. Originally, the cryogenic pellets uh, were designed to fuel the plasma because what we do is we take, the, we, we take deuterium or tritium, we freeze it, uh, with uh, liquid helium, and then we take this ice uh, ice cube and we launch it in the middle of the plasma, where the fast particles of the plasma can ablate all the fuel and deposit the fuel in the core of the plasma instead of having having it deposited at the edge of the plasma. However, what we realized is that if we take smaller pellets, not big pellets that are used for fueling, but smaller pellets, when these pellets go through the edge transport barrier, they can basically uh, create a perturbation, and this perturbation can, uh, can very easily uh, lead to, to an elm. And we see that here, we see the pellet is detected and entering the plasma, and then immediately an elm is uh, is detected uh, from the edge transport barrier. The experiment here is not actually using the pellets, but the experiment here acts as proof that we can use the pellets in order to, co to control the ELM frequency. Actually, what we see here is the controller being a bit confused by pellets because the controller has another player <laughs> Uh, affecting the, the ELM frequency. And what we, what we see here is that the controller is not acting as, as, as well as it used to act when it was alone. So, but th this system is proof that we can have another actuator. Now, let's go to uh, another way to control ELMs. Uh, and I'm doing this in order to demonstrate how complicated a system can be, but uh, we will get there. So uh, the, uh, the other way that we can use to control uh, ELMs is using resonant magnetic perturbation. Basically, these are, magnetic, these are perturbation of the magnetic field that have a radial component. That means a component which is perpendicular to the magnetic field that confines the plasma. If we can make such perturbation near the edge of the plasma, these perturbations can cause elms. And 
while there are coils specifically designed for this, the experiments that we realized are with some coils that are used for error field correction uh, here in that error field correction basically is the correction of errors from non axisymmetric fields that we have and um, but in this case it was used to to, to do the to to do the magnetic uh, perturbations what we see here is a plasma which initially has high intensity low frequency elms and when the efcc circuit is uh, is charged it immediately transitions to lower intensity and higher frequency elms so it immediately transitions to to pacing elms that we can use to to pace the <clears throat> that that are less destructive for the machine but why do we actually want to control the 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 elm frequency we we see here we have created three different actuators in order to control the elm frequency what would be the use of controlling the frequency other than the protection of the machine well to talk about this we must first talk about how impurities are accumulated in the core of the plasma what happens is when we have a high uh, intensity elms of lower frequency <clears throat> these elms are eroding material from the vessel in this case it is mostly tungsten and this material finds its way to the core of the plasma when this happens the the high z impurities that have reached the core of the plasma are emitting a lot of radiation and energy is lost from the core and so the temperature at the core of the plasma is collapse is collapsing uh, and uh, as we can see here this is the central temperature and we see it collapsing collapsing uh, after that, because of, of, of the temperature collapse or the temperature decay, we see a loss of confinement and the peaking of the soft X-ray signals, which are basically generated by the high Z impurities. This is a highly undesirable situa situation that we don't want to have in our plasmas because basically plasmas are collapsing and we are leading to disruptions. So can, how can we deal with this? Well, a very good way to deal with, uh, with this impurity accumulation is basically ELMS. ELMS can be used uh, as a means to flush out impurities from the core of the plasma. And we have a, a showcase here where we, we have similar discharges, but in one case, we have a high gas scenario. In the other case, we have a low gas scenario. The red case is low gas. The, the, black cases is the high gas scenario. In the high gas scenario, because we have, we, we are sustaining elms for a longer period, we see that all the impurities are uh, flushed out and the, uh, the power, the, the radiated power is kept in acceptable levels. In the second case where we have the low gas scenario, we see that the elms are stopping quite early and then the, the, the radiated power increases very abruptly and we have a higher chance of uh, leading into a disruption. Uh, a similar observation was made in, in a recent paper we, we wrote uh, where not only gas was used but also pellets. And what we have seen is that because in the case where we have pellets, uh, this is the case where we have only gas, but low gas, this is higher gas, and this is gas and pellets. In this case, we can see multiple elms uh, that are induced in the plasma. The red cases are uh, elms induced by pellets, and the green cases are elms induced naturally from, from the gas. And what we see in this case is that we have a, a more performant plasma. And this is the performance. This is basically the neutrons that are produced from DD reactions, which, is, which gives us a sense of the performance of the plasma. 
and we see that uh, this high L, high frequency, low intensity ELM regime is highly desirable. However, there are these are not the only way we have to control the impurity accumulation. Another way has to do with the heating. And in Z, we have different ways of heating the plasma. As we said before, the heating with using the, the ohmic heating from the central solenoid is not efficient in higher temperatures. And this is why we have developed different systems for the heating. Here you see neutral beam, uh, yeah, neutral beams that we are using to heat the plasma. This is basically, we are accelerating uh, ions, we neutralize them and we inject them in, into the plasma to transfer their energy to plasma particles and heat the plasma. And we also have uh, RF antennas that we use uh, to, to excite the ions, basically, to have ion cyclotron resonance heating inside the plasma. When we use these systems, we see a big difference in the case where we use only the NBI and the case we use the ICRH. Here we start with a similar plasma, and this is the beginning uh, where we, the blue is the case where we only have NBI and the red is the case where we have NBI and ICRH. And what we see is a higher peaking of the temperature when we have the ICRH. But if we take a look at what happens a bit later, about two seconds later, we see that in the case of, of ICRH, the central peaking of the temperature is really higher. And this central peaking, if we look at the bolometry, uh, that we have here, this is ICRH and I, radiation from the core of the plasma, that means a lot of impurities. In this case, the impurities are confined outside of the plasma. And the reason for this is this gradient of temperature that is flushing out all the impurities. But why does this gradient happen? It basically has to do with the way that we heat the plasma. NBI, while it is very efficient in heating the plasma, it has a very broad profile where the power is deposited. While ICRH heating, it's actually happening at the core of the plasma. And this is because the ICRH heating is happening close to the cyclotron resonance surface. And the cyclotron resonance surface can be tailored to, to accommodate whatever need we have because the, the, the cyclic resonance, resonance surface depends on the magnetic field, depends on the mass of the species that we are heating. In this case, it was hydrogen. And this can only be a very small minority, but this very small minority can transfer the heat to other particles. So we see that ICRAs can be used very efficiently to control, uh, to control the, the impurity accumulation as well. So if we take everything that we have developed so far and put it all together, we see that we can end up with fairly complicated systems. And this, this exercise can be, can be continued until we have really, really complicated networks of controllers. Because we see if we have an impurity, if we build an impurity controller, we can use ICRH, which is the heating scheme as an actuator, but we can also use the L frequency as an actuator. But the L frequency is a, is a controller of its own that uses different actuators as well. So we, we see that fairly quickly, this can be very complicated. This can be a very complicated problem. And uh, I want to close with, with this. Uh, what happens when we have fairly complicated problems? Well, recently, it seems that the, the solution is always some kind of neural network. And this is a very interesting work that, uh, that was published recently, and it is a collaboration between uh, EPFL, we, they have a, a tokamak of their own, and they, they, they do really nice work with operations, and uh, the, the company DeepMind, which has an expertise in, in artificial intelligence. And basically, what they have built is a reinforcement learning uh, uh, neural network that they can use, they can use 
and sorry for for not being an expert in artificial intelligence, but from from my understanding, they have built a, a model that allows them to train the network, and then this network can basically replace the conventional control system that we have uh, that we have for TCV, and. The real impressive part of this work is that they are very flexible in the systems they can generate uh, using this system, uh, the, the configurations of the magnetic field they can generate using this system. And if we look at the demonstration, well, we have the fundamental demonstration. Uh, basically, uh, they create a typical TCV plasma uh, and they compare it with the efficiency of the of the conventional controller and the system seems to, to work quite well but uh, they, they actually went a bit further in 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 this uh, in this effort and they created some re really obscure configurations that we don't really use in, in fusion but they are a very good demonstration of uh, how flexible a, a network a, a neural network like this can be and uh, the, the, the entire field of artificial intelligence, as you can understand, is, is one of the fields that we are really trying to use in fusion uh, for, for, for the last years. And it is a very active uh, area of research. So with that contribution from my colleagues, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be very happy to respond. Well, thank you very much for the very interesting things that you told us. It is indeed time for questions. So let's see first in the audience if there is someone who wants to ask something. Yes, please. So what is it that limits us from attaining uh, uh, operational fusion in the last 70 years? New uh, instabilities that are discovered why don't we have fusion like 60 years ago and we're still waiting? Well, uh, I would say a number of things. So instabilities is definitely one of the things that, that are creating a lot of problems. So ELMS is a kind of instability that we have managed to, to control, that we have managed to, to work with. But there are many, many other kinds of instabilities uh, that we don't know how to deal with. Uh, so instabilities is, def is definitely one of the problems. The other problem is, uh, in my view, has to do with with. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I, I try not to be too harsh, but um, another problem has to do with limited understanding of transport in plasmas. The confinement that we get in tokamaks is not what we expected to have. And this has a lot to do with uh, non-classical transport, turbulent transport, and many different phenomena that, that are affecting the ability of tokamaks to contain particles. So, if, even if we solve these problems, there are still many technical problems to solve. So for example, we, we, we said that tritium for a machine to be self-sustained needs to be bred inside the tokamak. We know that this can be done with lithium, but the technology is not actually developed yet. Uh, there are many, many steps before we reach a fully functioning tokamak. Uh, some of them are technical, some of them are scientific, lack of, of understanding. Uh, but I, I believe this is the, the, the this is a high risk, high gain situation. The gain is too high. So you definitely need to make the investment of time to overcome all these issues. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Let's finish here first, and then we. Do, do you have a, a study at the other case of particle acceleration at the X point? You have a formation of X X point there. Yes. 
So, is it uh, meaningful or can it affect uh, your system? Yes. So the, the X point has uh, zero uh, poloidal um, uh, poloidal field, but the the the, rota the toroidal field it's it's still unaffected. Uh, however, it is true that we have many instabilities inside the plasma, and we have many modes where we see impurity accumulation close to the X point. And when this happens, we have a very a highly radiative X point, and this can cause many problems. Uh, we also have I don't have anything to present here, but we have other phenomena that are happening close to the X point that can that can cause a lot of problems. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 there is no there's no point discussing them if we if I don't have anything to show you here. But yeah, the 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 a very common problem that we see in plasmas is impurity accumulation close to this magnetic null point. Okay. Then Professor Alexandrakis wants to ask something, please. Ναι, καταρχήν συγγνώμη για τη συζήτηση περί χόρτων που παρησέχουν στην Ελλάδα. Κανένα πρόβλημα, αλλά κύριε Σαβράκη, ρωτάτε στα αγγλικά γιατί το γράφουμε μέσα και το παρακολουθούμε μετά άλλοι απ' έξω, οπότε να συνεχίσουμε τη συζήτηση στα αγγλικά για να μπορούμε να το ανεβάσουμε μετά. Και εγώ απορούσα γιατί δεν χρησιμοποιείτε την ηλικία στριών χιλιάδων ετών και βάλει ελληνική γλώσσα. Ναι, γι' αυτό. περιπτώσει. Ας περάσουμε στα... <laughs> στην uh, αγγλική γλώσσα. Well, it was a very interesting talk and uh, thank you about it. And uh, I have some comments and a couple of questions uh, after that. Well, the first comment is that uh, ITER is doing very well. And I'm glad that you have, we have a new result from ITER, which was, uh, if I remember well, the first uh, instrument machine that achieved the Lawson criterion about uh, 30 years ago or so. Uh, and this shows- Jet, you mean? Uh, jet, jet, I, I'm sorry. I'm running ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so this uh, gives an answer to those that uh, uh, close uh, all the instruments simply because they think that they are obsolete. And ITER is and JET is certainly not one of those. Well, speaking about uh, JET uh, and, uh, and ITER and other machines, I remember 50 years ago when I was a graduate student, uh, they told us that uh, by the end of the century, which was the 20th century, not this century, we would have plenty of energy from control nuclear fusion. And we are in the second, uh, we are running in the third decade of the 21st century, and this is not in sight yet. Uh, of course, there have been a lot of uh, problems with ITER. I think most of them are political rather than scientific or engineering, with uh, participants uh, coming in and out. I think uh, the United States is one of them. And uh, probably the most important is the, uh, uh, the balance between uh, uh, corporate interests and the interests of uh, humanity as a whole. And I have in mind the interests of the oil industry and the so-called uh, green uh, industry, which is not that green after all, but this is another another issue. And if I remember well, nuclear fusion is not among the uh, environmentally uh, friendly uh, energy resources as uh, described uh, or as defined by the European Union. So uh, I'm not sure when ITER will produce uh, the first uh, energy. Uh, I'm not so sure that it will be during my, my lifetime. Uh, but, uh, and all this situation with ITER, I think makes the JET uh, contribution uh, very valuable, in particular since the confinement uh, findings that you described in your talk 
can be used in, uh, in either or other machines. So this is a general comment about uh, JET and ITER. Now, uh, the question has to do with other confinement schemes. For example, I, I have seen recently some uh, interesting results from stellarators and from uh, in, in inertial fusion. And uh, I wonder if you could, uh, could comment on, on those uh, in comparison, of course, with the prospects of uh, ITER. Thank you. Okay. So there are definitely many interesting, interesting results in other confinement schemes, I would say. Like from a scientific point of view, inertial confinement fusion is also really interesting. But well, at least me, I fail to see how this can be applied in a real life, in a real life situation where you have to, to extract energy out of it. Stellarators are really important. Uh, the research that we are doing now, especially in uh, Weldenstein uh, 7X in, in Greuswald in Germany, Eurofusion is heavily invested in this and it, it is participating and they are really exploring the avenue of the stellarators just to make sure. I think to some degree, the initial success of the tokamak shadowed all the research that was going on in, in Stellarators. And uh, they, they, they were a bit left behind, but uh, very interesting, very interesting results. And actually a big, a big uh, advantage of the Stellarators is that they are, because they don't use a solenoid to induce, to induce the, the toroidal current, they're inherently stable machines. But at the same time, the confinement we have achieved is poor compared to what we have achieved in tokamaks. So uh, I'm, 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 not, I'm definitely not a Stellarator expert. So I don't want to, to say something that I'm going to regret <laughs> because I was ignorant. Uh, but I think, I think the research that is happening with Stellarators is really interesting. Right now, it seems that most of the fusion community is invested in tokamaks. And this is mostly because of ITER, because if all the tokamaks that we use in, in, in Eurofusion, which is the European Consortium for, for Fusion, are concentrated towards studies for ITER and extrapolating results to ITER. Um, so uh, ITER was a big investment. Uh, I think it has been something like 20 billion so far, and probably it will be more over the next, I don't know, however long it takes to, to get some results from ITER. Um, I think it's definitely worth it, uh, but yeah, it, it seems that everybody is concentrated on Tokamak and a lot, of, a lot of private companies nowadays are investing in fusion. Uh, Tokamak Energy here in, uh, here in uh, well, not here, I'm actually in Greece, but <laughs> Tokamak Energy in, in Oxford or near Oxford, and um, Spark uh, in close to MIT. Uh, a lot of other private companies are investing in, in tokamaks, but there are other ideas as well. Um, so yeah, even though I'm not an expert in, in the other concepts, I think a lot of them, they, they carry a lot of interest. And uh, another thing I would like to do is, uh, I'm definitely an advocate of fusion, but me personally, I didn't make any promises. <laughs> So uh, I, I think fusion is definitely a long-term project. It's not easy to, to, to define very specific deliverables when there is still a lot of understanding that we need to get. So uh, it's definitely a very long-term goal. Uh, what I would be very happy to see would be for fusion to be able to diffuse a lot of the results that we are making for fusion, because we make remarkable advan advances, both in the physics and the understanding of physics, but also in technology. So I would love for fusion to be able to diffuse some of these results to something that will benefit, well, society in a financial or in a, in a technological uh, way. Um, more immediately. 
like other big science projects do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me check if there is any other question here. No, and if there is no other question from the audience in here, then thank you again. Thank you again for the very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me.